Good evening, colleagues, um, guests to Keele. Very warm welcome to Keele University tonight on the occasion of the inaugural lecture of Professor Nick Seeger. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is David Amigoni, and I'm the <coughs> director of the Institute for Social Inclusion at Keele University. And I'm also a, prof a professor of Victorian literature, so a close working colleague uh, of Nick's. And it's a personal pleasure for me to be able to do this tonight as I stand in um, for Professor Donna Lee, who should have been doing the introduction. Uh, Professor Donna Lee is the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean for Humanities and Social Sciences, and she sends her apologies because she's unwell tonight, so we wish her uh, a good and speedy recovery. So let me just begin by saying a few words um, about Nick by way of introduction. Nick Seeger grew up in Leicester, the youngest of five children of Peter and Susan Seeger, and was the first of his family to go to university, and his family point out that he's never left. <laughs> he went to the University of East Anglia to do a BA English Literature, attracted by the idea of becoming uh, a novelist in the steps of UEA graduates such as Ishiguru and Ian McEwan, um, as well as by the availability of a minor route in maths, um, which he took. The creative writing didn't take off, but he developed a strong interest in 18th century literature and went on to do an MA at Leeds and then a PhD at Nottingham. Nick joined Keel as a lecturer in 2009. Nick is one of those people who can teach the canon, and he teaches widely across English and related areas, from Anglo-Saxon through to uh, modern film and TV adaptations of fiction, including, of course, his own specialist interest in the 18th century, of which we will hear much more tonight. In 2010, um, Nick married Ginny, Ginny Wexstein, in her native Virginia, and it's a real delight to welcome the family um, tonight. So Ginny is here uh, with Nick, with, with, with their children, twin boys Sam and Teddy, and daughter Ida. So a very warm welcome um, to them. On April Fool's Day 2020, one week into the first lockdown, Nick became head of the School of Humanities, where it says here he's grateful to remain today. Nick is a very popular um, head of school, as I think we can all see from the, uh, from the gathering um, tonight. He enjoys working, indeed, with fantastic colleagues in the school um, and those on the faculty executive. But when he comes back in research terms, time and time again, to Daniel Defoe. And in the last year, he's published a major edition of Defoe's Correspondence with Cambridge University Press and edited the Oxford Handbook of Defoe. And this is a good way of thinking about the contribution, the research contribution that Nick makes. Nick produces world-leading research on what might be called the long 18th century, a period that begins in the 17th century, around 1660, and it goes as far as the first decades of the 19th century, where I hang out, um, up to about 1830. As a book historian, he works at the intersection between literature, history, politics, and theology, and his most distinguished work is perhaps his recent prize-winning scholarly edition of the correspondence of Daniel Defoe. Defoe, writer, journalist, and one of the pioneers of the literary forms that we now know as the novel. Indeed, a key area of Nick's research is the origins and history of the novel, the outstanding literary form of our age that came into being in the course of the long 18th century. Nick has made many distinguished contributions in leading international journals to the ongoing debate about the origins of the novel, along with editing important editions of key 18th century biographies, for example, Samuel Johnson's Life of Richard Savage, all of which, all of that prose, I think, contributes to the emergence of the novel as a genre. Tonight he will be presenting on that key research question that continues to preoccupy many scholars and cultural historians of the early modern and modern periods, and to which he has made a distinguished contribution, the origins of the novel. Please join me in welcoming Nick Seeger as he lectures on true lies, fact, fiction, and the origins of the British novel. Wow. 
Well, thank you so much, David. Um, it's an unspeakable pleasure to be introduced by David because when I um, first arrived in this area um, in April 2019 for an interview um, at Kiel, it was David who, um, along with um, Kerry, um, who's also here tonight, met me and another candidate and took us for um, dinner. So David, uh, we, we climbed into the back of David's um, little red hatchback, I remember it so well, um, and went for dinner. And uh, David told me at that time about his very young uh, twins and how I laughed. About <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to do lots and lots of thanks at the start, but I'm going to make sure that I definitely thank um, everybody, both for coming, but also all of those who have been so kind to me over the last 14 and a bit years. Um, at Kiel as well. Okay, so True Lies, Fact Fiction and the Origins of the British Novel. And already the technology is not working. There we go. Okay, so um, for William Shakespeare and John Milton, whose writing careers ended in the 17th century, prose fiction was barely an option, certainly not an attractive one. But for Walter Scott and Jane Austen, who came to prominence in the early 19th century, the novel, as it was the by then increasingly known, was an obvious choice. This lecture asks what changed in the intervening years, and it suggests that evolving attitudes to truth and fictionality were key to the rise of the novel in Britain, to the status that it has enjoyed uh, for the last 200 years or so as perhaps the preeminent literary mode. There's no single cause for the sizable growth, both in simple numerical terms, but also I think in um, aesthetic and um, sort of cultural impact terms across the course of the 18th century. Literary history clearly relates to larger cultural forces as well as artistic innovation and experimentation. No one sat down intending to invent the novel. On the one hand, the upward progress of the novel is a sidebar in the development of a print culture in Britain after the relaxation of press controls in the later 17th century, an acceleration in the um, sort of presence of professional imaginative writing, the sense that creative authorship could be a vocation, and the related rise in literacy levels as well. There was a gradual movement, broadly speaking, from communal um, reading to silent, individual, and absorptive reading of new works rather than iterative readings of established tomes like the Bible and ancient classics. Books were more handleable, more portable, and more available. This is the reading revolution proposed by Rolf Engelsing, um, a German uh, historian. And these changes in the public, its preferences, and its capabilities around leisure are broadly consonant with the growth in Britain of a middle class and the rise of philosophical empiricism, the belief following John Locke's essay concerning human understanding that knowledge of the world is acquired by the self through the senses rather than stemming from innate ideas, such that stories told in quite demotic prose about relatively ordinary people making sense of their quotidian experiences were increasingly appealing. This is what the novel appeared to provide. In this understanding, and its most famous proponent is Ian Watt in The Rise of the Novel, a book published in 1957, the defining formal feature of the novel is realism, the technique of rendering reality verbally in ways that aims for authenticity to actual experience, departing from the more universal pretensions of romance and allegory, older forms of fiction that seem not to satisfy the demand for personalised literary characters stemming from the new fiction of the 18th century. What does this look like? This is a bit broad brush strokes, but in John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, published in 1678, a character called Christian travels through a mostly non-specific landscape, encountering characters with names like Faithful and Ignorance, navigating locations like Vanity Fair and Doubting Castle on his way to the heavenly city. Three score and ten years later, in Henry Fielding's Tom Jones, the hero of that novel travels the Great Western Road from Somerset to London, getting caught up in the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion, a, a real event, and eventually marrying a woman called Sophia Weston, a kind of 
mostly realistic name, right? So in this kind of account, fiction is as old as time. Fiction is the constant um, and is common to human cultures, fairy tales, myths, and so on. It just takes a particular form in 18th century Britain, a more realistic form entailing contemporaneity, so sort of recognition that this should be about people's real modern experiences, and a great deal of specificity of time and location. It should happen in real settings and with real a kind of a sense of duration. And this is all in response to these kinds of socio-economic and intellectual conditions. But an, <clears throat> but an aspect of early fiction that certainly surprised me in my early encounters with it as a student is the nature of the truth claims that come with novels in this era. The life and strange surprising adventures of Robinson Crusoe was a landmark in the development of the novel. It, may, it has made its author, Daniel Defoe, a household name, giving rise to thousands of editions, translations, adaptations and imitations across culture and media. Yet when Crusoe was published in April 1719, it professed not to be the work of an imaginative writer at all, but a factual record. The title page, which describes the central action, not all that ac accurately actually, but we'll skip over that, makes no mention of Defoe at all, and it insists that the book was written by himself, i.e. by Crusoe. So this title page, which was primarily designed to catch the attention of bookstall browsers, is followed by a preface, supposedly written by an editor, who says, and I'm quoting, he believes the whole thing to be a just history of fact, neither is there any appearance of fiction in it. There's clearly some equivocation here. The book's factuality is asserted as belief rather than as certitude, and he denies the, appear the appearance of fiction rather than the actuality of it. But there's little initially that would differentiate this volume from other <laughs> travel books of the period or from the life stories of individuals with extraordinary experiences which were increasingly making their way into print especially as Crusoe follows the broad pattern of a religious confessional, with the narrator progressing from religious ignorance through punishment, his island experience, to conversion, not entirely unlike Bunyan's Christian, though very much an occupant of the modern material commercial world. Similarly to Crusoe, Afra Ben's Orinoco, three decades or so earlier, professes to be an authentic um, story, a true history, its title page says, though the hero, Orinoco, is capable of superhuman feats that mark the book out clearly as a fiction, as a kind of species of romance. Oops, sorry, that's a mistake. Um, ben unconvincingly explains anything wondrous in the story as attributable to its setting, first in Africa and then in Suriname. So in short, to a greater extent than restoration fictions like Ben's, Robinson Crusoe aimed to deceive its first readers into believing it was authentic. There was no real precedent, hence no readerly demand for the kind of fictitiousness it offered. We find attestations of truth in earlier fiction like this one, but not really the adherence to probable events or kind of an accuracy of naming of character that would sustain that. Crusoe was an instant bestseller, a real commercial hit, and this drew attention to its truth status, and several publications challenged this truth, outing Defoe as the author in the process, because it was initially kind of pseudonymous, published as, as, as if by Crusoe. Very little read today is the sequel that Defoe rushed out later in the year, The Father Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. This book takes the hero to parts of the world not treated in the original, Africa, Asia, and Russia. And The Father Adventures maintains the fiction against these detractors that Crusoe is the real author, the adventures authentic, first on the title page, written by himself, and then again in a preface, which responds to the endeavours of envious people who reproach it with being a romance. But then he seems to concede some ground, insisting on the morally improving quality of the story, saying this must legitimate all the part that may be called invention or parable in the story. 
So Defoe was working out his position in relation to truth and falsehood, not in isolation as a kind of philosophical exercise or artistic challenge, but within a combative print culture and in dialogue with his critics. In late 1719, an old journalistic rival of Defoe's named Charles Gildon published an unflinching attack on Defoe and Crusoe, which he titled, mimicking, as you can see, the full title of Crusoe, The Life and Strange Surprising Adventures of DDF of London, Hosier. Gildon was drawing attention to Defoe's background in trade, his previous vocation as a dealer in hosiery, and to Defoe's ethically questionable career, which David alluded to, in political journalism and espionage. It was commonplace for political opponents to uh, depict Defoe as a liar, as a venal hack and so on, and Robinson Crusoe provided Gildon with an opportunity to refresh that attack. In this lampoon of Robinson Crusoe, within months of its first publication, Gildon doesn't just denounce Defoe, he makes Defoe a fictional character. He depicts Defoe confronted in the street by his creations, putting the author on the same plane of reality as his made-up characters. In what Gildan's title page calls the dialogue between Defoe, Robinson Crusoe, and his man Friday, Crusoe and Friday um, confront Defoe on the street and they're armed with pistols, indignant at how they've been depicted in the novel, and they're after revenge. We are come to punish thee now for making us such scoundrels in thy writing, Crusoe tells Daniel whose desperate pleas seek to confine these um, beings to the world of fiction. Why, ye airy phantoms, are you not my creatures? Mayn't I make of you what I please, Crusoe replies. Crusoe replies that when you raise beings contradictory to common sense and destructive of religion and morality, they will rise up against you, and that's what they're doing. They point out inconsistencies in how they've been characterised, such as Crusoe's very changeable religious... um, professions. Friday's words of reproach are very interesting because they could be seen as the start of the post-colonial reaction to Defoe's imperial myth in Robinson Crusoe, adopting but objecting to the pidgin English that Defoe has Friday speak. Have injured me to make me such blockhead, so much contradiction as to be able to speak English tolerably well, that's quoting Defoe, in a month or two and not to speak it any better 12 years after. This is entirely legitimate. Defoe's Friday picks up enough English within a few weeks to enter into abstruse theological debates with Crusoe, but his grammar is the same a few years later. It all seems very silly, but I really think that no earlier fiction got this kind of scrutiny for its basic plausibility. And it gets quite um, scatological and graphic. Um, Desperate to avoid corporeal punishment, Daniel's final plea is that Crusoe's muddled representation is intentional and is a compliment. You are the true allegorical image of thy tender father Daniel, he tells Robinson Crusoe. I drew thee from the consideration of my own mind. I have been all my life that rambling, inconsistent creature which I have made thee. It's all to no avail. Crusoe and Friday are joined by other infuriated characters from the story. They force-feed Daniel his many writings until he vomits, and they toss him in a blanket until he poos himself. And that was the, um, the poo joke that I promised my children. <laughs> <clears throat> Defoe did not back down, and ever ready to seize on a commercial opportunity, he wrote a third volume of the Crusoe story, a series of essays called Crusoe's Serious Reflections. In the preface, he responds to Gildan's allegations. The envious and ill-disposed part of the world have raised objections against the first two volumes on pretense that the story is feigned, that it is all a romance, formed and embellished by invention to impose upon the world. In a surprising move, he picks up on Gildan's facetious idea that Crusoe is really Defoe, and he makes out that Defoe's inability to invent a coherent character is a reflection of Defoe's own duplicity. He adopts this kind of strange legalistic tone you know, in the voice of a fictitious character. I, Robinson Crusoe, being at this time in perfect and sound mind and memory, thanks be to God, therefore, do hereby declare that their objection is an invention scandalous in design and false in fact, and do affirm that the story, though allegorical, is also historical, 
and that it is the beautiful representation of a life of unexampled misfortunes and of a variety not to be met with in the world, sincerely adapted to and intended for the common good of mankind, and designed at first, as it is now further applied, to the most serious uses possible. So it's kind of this moralistic defence which suggests that, um, and he's doing all of this in the voice of a fictitious person, that actually there is a kind of truth to the whole thing. So he offers the tantalising suggestion, Defoe does, that he himself is the subject of Crusoe's story. My bigger point here, because it's too complicated to get into the kind of possibility that Robinson Crusoe is really a stand-in for Defoe, um, my bigger point is that Defoe clings to the pretense that the story had real-world reference, even as he shifted the ground of his claim from literal truth, you know, all of this actually happened to somebody, to allegorical correspondence. Well, it, it didn't happen literally, but it all stands for things that really did happen. And yet there's a huge playfulness with having a fictional character himself, I, Robinson Crusoe, assert both his own reality what's the kind of truth status of that, and the possibility that he's a stand-in for some unspecified, although hinted at Defoe, other person. The conceptual category of fiction, at least as it pertained to stories in prose, was as yet very inchoate, and it's kind of this sort of working it out in process that really interests me. Across the next century, there was a broad epistemological shift from a narrow construction of truth as historical veracity this really happened, to a more capacious understanding that could include mimesis or realism. This may not actually have happened, but it could. Despite Gildan's attack on Crusoe, um, the novel was widely recognised not only as one that had stimulated the market for new fiction, but also that Defoe had taken new steps in the representation of reality. I want to illustrate this with a, a brief passage that I think... Um, points to what the new realism looked like. It's when Crusoe boards the wreck of the ship that brings him to, the, to his island. So he washes up and then the, the wreck of the ship kind of gets um, sort of grounded. He says, a little after noon, I found the sea very calm and the tide ebbed so far out that I could come within a quarter of a mile of the ship. I resolved if possible to get to the ship. So I pulled off my clothes for the weather was hot to extremity and took the water. I'm not going to read the next bit in full, but he describes, replete with detail, you know, the, the temperature, the calmness of the sea, um, how the grounded vessel sits lopsided, making it quite difficult to um, board. He swims round it, he finds a dangling rope, and he finally gets aboard. The point really is that the specificity of the description, the rendering of things with a kind of precise level of... Um, kind of resemblance of fact, not just saying that he boarded the ship, but detailing how, is what constitutes this realism. On board, he finds the provisions that he's looking for unspoiled. Being very well disposed to eat, I went to the bread room and filled my pockets with biscuit and ate it as I went about other things, for I had no time to lose. I also found some rum in the great cabin, of which I took a large dram, and which I had indeed need enough of to spirit me, for what was before me. Now I wanted nothing but a boat to furnish myself with many things which I foresaw would be very necessary to me. It's this kind of quite plodding and laboured sort of way of telling the story that gives Crusoe this presence, I think, as a character. So many people find this incredibly tedious, but I find it absolutely fascinating. And um, he fills his pockets uh, with this biscuit, and he makes a plan to return to salvage the many things which I, had, which I foresaw would be very necessary to me. And he tells us lots and lots about these things. Um, and he prepares for um, more than a quarter of a decade of survival on this island. It's all very innocuous. Or is it? In his um, satire against Robinson Crusoe, Gildan had noticed, and I wonder if you did, that Crusoe manages both to strip off his clothes before approaching the wreck and to fill his pockets with biscuit once aboard. Defoe, or his publishers, tried to correct the error in a later edition, specifying that Crusoe leaves on his sailor's breeches, but that did not do the trick. Proving that it's not the crime but the cover-up, the textual amendment only drew greater attention to the error, as Gildan called foul, pointing out 
that sailors' breeches did not contain pockets. <laughs> and even when they do, the pockets are very small. And these sea biscuits, also known as hard tacks, suited to transoceanic voyages, are very large, too big for these pockets. Now, I confess, I've never done the sartorial or the culinary research required to corroborate any of this, but the Greenwich uh, Maritime Museum does have a page on these biscuits. Anyway, Gildan believed the errors not only laid bare the fallacy of any pretension to truthfulness, but exposed Defoe as a clumsy, ignorant writer, a downright liar. The joke at the expense of Crusoe's pockets did not stop there. In 1725, a writer in the London Journal mentions the pocket episode as a most notorious blunder. Then in 1726, a book called Travels into Several Remote Nations of the World was published in London. It professed on its title page to be by Lemuel Gulliver, a ship surgeon, then a captain, and it came with the familiar bibliographical traits of authenticity, a solemn title page, not really giving away what, what goes on, a portrait of Gulliver declaring his honesty in Latin, and um, a po-faced preface that vouches for Gulliver's veracity, even if he is going to tell us about miniature people, giants, and talking horses. Its original readers, beginning the book, might have had little suspicion that they were not dealing with another run-of-the-mill Mariner's Adventure book, as Gulliver is established as a quite stodgy storyteller. I'm not going to read this out again. I just want to draw attention via the highlighting to the ways in which Jonathan Swift, who, in case you don't know, was the author of Gulliver's Travels, is giving us this um, sort of account of himself with a, a precision of duration, you know, 14 years old, three years here, two years, seven months there, a precision of duration and of location, Nottinghamshire, Cambridge, London, Leiden, um, which is all spoofing how Defoe um, tells his stories with this kind of great attention to you know, how much time, how can things be measured, where was he, what, down to the degrees of latitude and so on. And as it goes on, this bland and literalistic narrative style, of course, cuts against the remarkable adventures that Gulliver experiences in Lilliput, Brobdingnag, and with the horses and so on. Famously, after his first shipwreck, Gulliver struggles ashore and collapses exhausted on the beach where he's bound and captured by the Lilliputians. When taken to give an account of himself before the commanding personage of the Emperor of Lilliput all of six inches high, Gulliver is made to empty his pockets, these pockets, in this kind of a coat. And their, the pockets and their content, as with Defoe, become a site of debate about plausibility, about does this work. We're invited to imagine Gulliver, who is supposed to have swum ashore, buffeted by the sea, in dangerous stormy waves, with the following items about his person in his pockets. A handkerchief, a snuff box, a diary, a comb, a razor, a set of eating utensils, a pocket watch, a set of pistols, a pouch of gunpowder, a pouch of bullets, silver and copper coins, nine large pieces of gold, a pair of spectacles, which he actually manages to secrete from the Lilliputians, a pocket perspective, so a kind of portable telescope, and several other little conveniences. He's also wearing a hat and carrying a sword, so no wonder he nearly drowns. <laughs> Swift has his fun at Gulliver's expense, having him recount all of this with his characteristically bland manner, and having the Lilliputians comically confused by the possible uses to which this giant can put all this stuff. But he's also harking back to Defoe's blunder over Crusoe's pockets, pointing out that the endeavour to render reality in all its banal specificity is prone to error, that the authenticating techniques of first-person narration with its eyewitness testimony are subject to obtuse egotism, and that roll calls of things, stuff, endless lists of stuff, however ostensibly tangible and real and usable, do not add up to some larger truth. The novel in the 18th century, as Michael McKeon has shown, was the product of an epistemological tussle between ways of seeing the world that stem from historiographical debate, scientific debate in the 17th century. So on the one side, a socially progressive view that candid realism, consonant with the new empiricism and scientific method, which purports to reflect reality through eyewitness testimony, 
is countered on the other side by a culturally conservative belief that individual perspective um, and judgment are merely subjective, distortive, and perhaps a more dangerous way of presenting the world than overt fictions such as romances. This is the polarity between Defoe and Swift. The valorization of personal, ex personal experience and point of view in Defoe is rejected in Swift's representation of an individualist who descends into madness and misanthropy. Formally and ideologically, Gulliver's Travels resists the cultural energies that propelled the novel. The conservative high churchman Swift satirises this taste for realistic fictions of compelling, introspective, worldly individuals cultivated by the middle-class dissenter Defoe. Yet Gulliver was every bit the commercially successful product of a burgeoning print culture, as was Crusoe, easy as it seems to arrogate to Defoe loftier motives than to Swift, to Swift loftier motives than to Defoe. So Swift's um, narrative, paradoxically, despite trying to satirise all of this stuff, I think contributes to the larger conversation about factuality and fiction that I think was constitutive of the novel's origin and its consolidation. The great novelists of the mid-century, Samuel Richardson and Henry Fielding, were heirs to this debate. Fielding's narrator in Joseph Andrews, published in 1742, insists that his story about particular people, those with precise names like Joseph Andrews and Abraham Adams, quote, delineate not men, but manners, not one individual, but a species. So it may be telling you stories about ordinary and particular people, but the point is to tell you something more universal. He says that the point is to achieve a grander significance, not a specific one. And Fielding goes against the grain of Defoe and of Richardson by embracing the fictionality of his book. The title page of Joseph Andrews acknowledges its model is um, Cervantes' Don Quixote, a professed work of the imagination that exposes the dangers of confusing fiction and the world as it truly is. And Fielding includes these meta-narrative chapters that explains the principles of the story's construction. So we get a certain amount of story and then he sort of stands back and tells you how it's being put together. By eschewing the increasingly hackneyed custom of claiming the book claiming that the book depicts real events, Fielding made plausibility, not authenticity, the standard for modern fiction. But he claimed that he had classical precedents for this, harking back to Aristotle as the originator of these ideas. Aristotle said, the poet's job is not to tell what has happened, but the kind of things that can happen, the kind of events that are possible according to probability or necessity. For the difference between the historian and the poet is this. The one tells what has happened, the other the kind of things that can happen. And in fact, that is why the writing of poetry is a more philosophical activity and one to be taken more seriously than the writing of history. And I'm sorry to my colleagues in history. Uh, for poetry tells us rather the universals, history, only the particulars. Between the time that Defoe insisted that Robinson Crusoe was a real person and 20 years later when Fielding insisted that his characters were not real people, a discourse of fictionality had been worked out. When Gildan noticed errors with Robinson Crusoe, he called the book a fiction and called Defoe um, not just a bad craftsman, but a liar. By the 1740s, the public was increasingly prepped to read novels as stories about imaginary, though often representative, people. Fielding went to lengths to explain that his characters were fictional and that the incidents had been contrived by a controlling artistic consciousness. He dispenses with the requirement, upheld by earlier fiction, that readers believe the story is literally true or possesses an allegorical correspondence to real people and events. Not only this, but Joseph Andrews was also a fiction based on a fiction, kind of a double layering of this, an extension of an existing imaginary world. It was an emanation of Fielding's famous spat with Samuel Richardson, his contemporary, following the publication of Richardson's Pamela in 1740. The pretense is that Joseph Andrews is not just imaginary, but that he's the brother of Richardson's heroine, Pamela Andrews, who had been presented in Pamela as a real person. Though it's not achieved the enduring fame of Crusoe or Gulliver, Pamela was their equal as a publish, publishing sensation. 
posing as the editor of what he calls on the title page a series of familiar letters which are purportedly authentic. He says it's a narrative which has its foundation in truth and nature. Richardson gave readers the compelling story of a young servant girl, 15, who, withstanding the sexual assaults of her late mistress's rakish son, who's named Mr B, manages to convert him from his wicked ways to virtue and ultimately becomes his wife. That's the reward for virtue. Giving a working-class heroine a powerful narrative authority, Pamela combined pious commentary with sexual titillation. The epistolary form of the novel, it's told as letters, closes the gap between narrative incident, the emotions they evoke, and their articulation in Pamela's letters. Pamela is assaulted by Mr B and gives her account of this straight away. The reader is only ever at the same point as her in knowing what's going on and what's coming next. And the composition of the letters are therefore part of the action, indeed a part of her defiance of her master's authority as he tries to prohibit her letter writing. And some of the um, images that follow in the wake of this depict moments of, of writing or of reading. So he's interrupting um, her writing in the top image of a Joseph Highmore painting. Um, and in the, in the bottom image, what's actually going on is that she's presenting her letters to him for him to read because, weirdly enough, the letters become part of the story and the sort of what converts him um, is reading the letters and understanding her personality, understanding her subjectivity, that he comes to um, decide that he doesn't want to you know, carry on like this and this, this all, apparently, in Richardson's understanding, makes him good marriage material. Pamela was a multimedia sensation. As well as paintings, plays, and souvenirs like fans and cups, it spawned many publications, some relishing its religious message, others skeptical of its dubious morality. Particularly the implication that coquettish working girls would see a blueprint for ensnaring susceptible young gentlemen. Like with Charles Gildon's expose of Defoe's authorship of Robinson Crusoe, Richardson's status as the author, rather than merely the editor, of Pamela's letters was soon called out. In 1741, Fielding did a hatchet job on Pamela with a book imaginatively called Shamala, a merciless parody that exposes Pamela as a designing harlot, her epistolary style not as artless but as calculating and vulgar. Shamala's exposure of Pamela's falsehoods and misrepresentations is, however, not the old allegation that it's all made up, but rather a kind of sustenance of the fiction and a claim that it's all been misreported. The editor says he has actual evidence of her dalliance with Parson Williams and he has the authentic papers to prove it. So he's kind of taking up the notion that this is all based on real documents and, and extending it. So there's this widespread anxiety about fiction because the view that literature should provide examples of good conduct prevailed. Writing that veered from fidelity to the truth could, it was thought, mislead readers who were constructed as impressionable and prone to unreflexive immersion. The most eminent literary critic of the age, Samuel Johnson, writing in the middle of the century, expressed his thoughts on the new trends in fiction, revealing a profound ambivalence that reflected that of his age. In his Rambler essay on fiction, Johnson frets that these books are consumed by the young, the ignorant and the idle, a reactionary attitude to new forms familiar to later eras, everything from cinema and pop music to video games and the internet. Johnson's moralism is based on the relationship to reality and truth professed in these realistic novels. The problem is not fidelity to actual experience as such. He celebrates the capacity of the new fiction to represent life in its true state, diversified only by accidents, he means events, that daily happen in the world and influenced by passions and qualities which are really to be found in the world. But Johnson's worry is that fidelity to quotidian life, the moral muddle of ordinary experience, breaches the principle that art should steer readers towards virtue and away from vice. He criticises writers like Fielding, who, for the sake of following nature, just telling it how it is, so mingle good and bad qualities in their principal personages, he means characters, that they are both equally conspicuous. Johnson's insistence that virtue is rewarded, 
Richardson, and Vice demeaned, not enough of that in Fielding, seems naively traditional in its adherence to the, di to the didactic view of imaginative writing. But there is some difference. He says, in narratives where historical veracity has no place, what we'd call novels, I cannot discover why there should not be exhibited the most perfect idea of virtue, not angelical, nor above probability. For what we cannot credit, we shall never imitate. So here he admits the desirability of believability, uh, that the idea that the didactic efficacy that he's looking for in this stuff um, would require authors to elide um, fictionality in how they represent the world. And as the 18th century wore on, fictionality became more commonly understood and authors could be confident that readers would not be confused about the ontological status of characters in, um, in these books, uh, that fiction would not be mistaken for fact. Francis Burney's Evelina, or The History of a Young Lady's Entrance into the World, was written at the apogee of the demand for epistolary novels awakened by Richardson, and it struck a chord because it cleverly aligns its publication strategy with its plot. The eponymous heroine, Evelina Villas, is a young orphan raised in rural innocence by an adoptive father who must enter the fashionable but treacherous, exciting but daunting world of London to make her case for recognition by her birth father, a wealthy nobleman. And inevitably, she's also exposed to a succession of suitors, some, some worthy, some not. And eventually, she marries Lord Orville and gains her patrimony. And this was written by Bernie as a very young woman, against the precepts and without the knowledge of her own father, published anonymously and to great acclaim. The heroine's quest for recognition and her naive negotiations of the pitfalls of the public world are therefore analogous to Bernie's self-exposure in publishing it. Her self-consciousness uh, manifests in the preface with hints that the author is a man, a stratagem for female novelists that endured well into the 19th century and beyond. In the Republic of Letters, she says, there is no member of such inferior rank or who is so much disdained by his brethren of the quill as the humble novelist, nor is his fate less hard in the world at large, since among the whole class of writers, perhaps not one, can be named of whom the votaries are more numerous but less respectable. In other words, novels are getting very popular, but novelists still can't get any respect. In promoting the novel's status, Bernie invokes not its relationship to fact, but the advantages of fiction. To draw characters from nature, though not from life, this is a quotation, the second one here, to draw characters from nature, though not from life, and to mark the manners of the times is the attempted plan of the following letters. This is related to what Fielding did, refusing to draw any specific individual, aiming instead to characterise the species or type. But in Bernie, the individual outlook, and precisely because it is an invented one, provides the perspective with which to mark the manners of the time. And this book stakes a claim for the novel as a potent mode of social commentary. And Evelina is a great satire on late Georgian fashionability and, and, and the bon tot and so on. Um, the key ingredient in all of this, I think, is probability. Like her predecessors, Bernie differentiates the novel from um, fantastical works, romance, where she says, you know, kind of all kinds of strange things can happen. And instead, she promotes sober probability. Probability or plausibility, as distinct from any pretension to actual reality, becomes the litmus test for the novel's truthfulness to experience. It attains this kind of universal significance in Aristotle's sense, not just a kind of series of particular facts, um, which is the business, allegedly, of history. I'm not going to dwell on these uh, quotations very much at all, because uh, I want to get on to, to concluding this. But um, I, I certainly don't think all of these things have been perfectly worked out by the start of the 19th century. And a couple of really fascinating historical novelists, um, you know, Scott and um, Shelley, um, hint at this. Um, Scott's fear is that he's mingling fiction with truth, and this is going to be seen by these severe antiquaries as a kind of... Um, uh, pollution of the historical record. So he's kind of got this in his mind. Um, but, but he nevertheless makes a case for fictionalising as telling a greater truth. And when Mary Shelley writes a, a, a novel about um, the 15th century royal pretender Perkin Warbeck, 
She says, um, initially it was, it's, it was proposed to her as a um, subject for historical detail. She might write some kind of history work. But on studying it, she says, I became aware of the romance which his story contains, while at the same time I felt it would be impossible for any narration that should be confined to the incorporation of facts related by our old chroniclers to do it justice. So to do this, all this material justice, she needs to have recourse to um, fiction. But this lecture really needs to conclude with um, Jane Austen, because it's in her works, pictures of a Regency England in many respects in denial of its own historical specificity, that we have this kind of fictional discourse that I think we all recognise instantaneously as novelistic. So here's the start of her second best work, which confidently, unlike pretty much everything I've covered so far, proclaims itself on the title page, a novel. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. So fictional characters depicted in the protracted manner of the novel could, it seemed by this point, be even be easier to identify with than real people. And that's because readers occupy this kind of superior position as a privileged and epistemologically superior witness of protagonists who, like Emma, exhibit limitations of judgment, limitations of self-knowledge, and a lack of empathetic capacity, at least for, for portions of the novel. So unlike figures represented in history or biography, novelistic characters seem permeable, already psychologically revealed or penetrated in the process of their construal. Their overt and never denied but never affirmed fictionality is not a barrier to, but the precondition of, their accessibility. All of this facilitates their immediacy, familiarity and intimacy. They appear to have the layers of a person, but constraints on our capacity to know them, which happens in the real world, are mitigated by how they're presented in fiction. So, the fictionality of the novel, I think, can seem so obvious that it can be easy to ignore, especially as fictionality as a category has been extended to cover all forms of narration, historical, scientific and more, by post-structuralism. But the flavour of the novel's claim to a non-literal truth was worked out in incremental and contested ways in 18th century Britain, when a more explicit discourse of novelistic fictionality developed. The novel tried for much of its early history to conceal its fictionality with realism, making truth claims it intended readers to accept. By the 19th century, readers had developed the usually unerring ability to tell the novel's fictional facts apart from mere deception. Um, and I think I'll stop there. And thank you very much for listening.